What is up, Watch Fam? I am Christian from Theo and Harris, and today I'm back here at London Jewelers' wonderful Manhasset Watch Boutique, um, taking a look at uh, some of your favorite brands, um, but particularly watches under the $5,000 mark. Um, it's often a misunderstood price point. Um, some people, kind of like elitists feel like you can't truly own a great watch under $5,000. The truth is, uh, while under 5K, you can't have everything, um, there are still value. There are still watches certainly worth owning. One of the things we're going to see a lot here are reissues. Reissuing old models has become a, uh, a serious pattern in the watch industry today. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, um, I think it's a terrific idea. When you're looking to you know, make a watch under 5K, when you're looking to stay under, you know, well, within budget restraints, not having to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in the development of a new design um, is a terrific way to do that. Uh, so with that being said, let's jump into our first reissue. First is a Longines Skin Diver. This watch actually is a reissue from 1959. As many of you know, Longines has an incredibly rich history and uh, this skin diver is no exception. It comes in at 42 millimeters, um, but its case doesn't seem all that large. It's more the lugs that protrude and give it a larger presence, um, but still on my just under seven inch wrist, I don't think it's all that like too big. Um, it's definitely too big for me, but I don't think it's crazy. Um, where I think that Longines totally hits it out of the park uh, is in the detail. The dial here is perfect. It's not a black gloss, um, it's not a black matte. It has a, a texture that I think is absolutely beautiful. It's no secret that I am a fan of faux patina. For those of you who don't know, um, faux patina uh, is the modern phenomenon, I suppose, uh, where uh, brands make new luminova, super luminova, new luminous material. It is usually white in color. They turn it brown. Um, and they turn it brown so uh, it resembles the aging of vintage tritium. So by definition, it is a little bit disingenuous, um, but there are certainly bigger problems in the world, and I, I think it's attractive. I think it has a beauty that white just doesn't. Um, it comes on a beautiful tropic-style strap, um, a super flexible rubber, Really, it's hard to beat something like this. It's a lovely alternative to a Submariner, let's say. And at 300 meter water resistance, it's actually just as capable of diving. Speaking about dive watches, let's move on to another uh, large, kind of controversial brand like Longines, um, Breitling. Breitling, like Longines, is a heritage Swiss watch manufacturer. Um, they've produced some of the most well-regarded watches of all time. The AOPA Navitimers and the Top Times, for example. This watch is another piece that has taken inspiration from um, the brand's past. Um, it is their Super Ocean Heritage. This example measures 42 millimeters, and this is the second iteration of this uh, new model, the Super Ocean. In this iteration, you can find a ceramic bezel and an updated movement. I actually own the first iteration of this watch um, with an aluminum bezel. I think the ceramic has a shine uh, that the aluminum does not. It's, it's very pretty. Uh, another, I hate to say it because it's, I guess, a boring remark, but truthfully, a Submariner alternative. It comes in blue. It also comes in black and, and a few other colors. What's special about this watch, in my opinion, um, what sets it apart is the bracelet. I think that this uh, woven, I suppose, like Milanese style bracelet is lovely. It's very vintage. I love the straight lugs. It's not something we would have projected would come out of Breitling all that long ago, but I know that I'm glad it did, and that seems to be the consensus among the watch community. Next, we've got a, a personal favorite. This is not a reissue. Um, this is a, a Nomos Metro. Beautiful watch, it measures 37 millimeters, which is a little bit larger than Rolex's classic Datejust, but um, its presence, due to its dial to bezel ratio, um, is larger. I love the wired lugs. Um, you do have a, a see-through sapphire case back. To me, it's the power reserve that separates this watch um, and makes it that much more interesting. I think that at this price point, it's hard to find watches that are as uh, attractive as they are original. That's a hard balance to find at this price point. Um, and Nomos 
knocks it out of the park with this. Um, even down to the date window, which is another kind of superficial, shallow thing to remark on, but it's the truth. Um, you know, we should never underestimate the you know importance or difficulty of proper design, um, and a date window is something that is often the demise of designs, and Nomos executes it perfectly. Wonderful watch, guys. Next, we're gonna go into a brand that has as of late, knocked it out of the park. A brand that, uh, when I first got into watches, had nothing going for it, for all intents and purposes. A brand that was not talked about very often, that was not admired very much, Oris. Fast forward just five or seven years, and they are on a winning streak. So much so that I brought two examples today to take a look at. This is their pointer date. Um, the pointer date is, is just a date complication. Um, it's nothing more than that, uh, but, it's something that was done more in the mid 20th century than it is done today. Um, I think it's lovely. It's a way to make the dial look more complicated uh, and also uh, omit a date window, like I said with Nomos, which is a very difficult element uh, to integrate into a dial. Um, so instead of playing that you know, dicey game of date execution, they avoided it altogether and put the date around the dial and had a hand point to the appropriate date. Um, that's simple. This example is lovely because of the color combination. It's an army-ish green uh, dial and bronze case. Um, the bronze case has a lovely coin edge bezel. Um, great watch, Oris. Nothing more to say. I suppose I'm going to jump over this Omega to touch on Oris one more time before we move on. This is their Diver 65. Um, I think it was their first big hit uh, coming back into you know, relevance, I suppose. It's a very loved watch. A diver with vintage or conservative uh, design, but modern and appropriate proportion. What I love most about this watch is its bracelet. This is a perfectly executed rivet bracelet. Um, the thinness jumps out. I'm an enormous fan of Tudor. Uh, I think that Tudor has done a lovely job in bringing their brand back from the dead, but I will say that their Oyster Rivet bracelets are too thick. Um, they lose the beauty of what Rolex originally intended when they invented the Oyster Rivet bracelet. Oris does not lose that. They capture it perfectly. Big props to you guys. Last, but certainly not least, let's touch on Omega. 1957 was a very interesting, uh, monumental year for the brand. They introduced their Railmaster, Speedmaster, and Seamaster. The Railmaster, which to date is the least talked about of the trio, uh, was originally intended for engineers and scientists. Uh, magnetic fields, as many of you guys know, have a funny way of destroying a watch uh, through its balance and hairspring, and a watch like this, the Railmaster, uh, protected against that. What's great about this particular example is it's a well-executed, uh, logical evolution of an important uh, uh, line. Many brands today have a hard time avoiding the reissue tactic. There, there are one, two, three reissues on this uh, table here, and I have no problem with the reissue, but a brand gets extra points when they're able to, instead of just reproducing what's already been successful, when they're able to add on top of that, when they're able to bring um, new expertise to the table. And that's what Omega did here. The execution of the dial, the bracelet, the case, the utilization of their coaxial movements, um, everything kind of fell into place here. Maybe it's the biggest home run on this table, um, even though it's 200 bucks over our $5,000 limit. Um, I think that that is, in the grand scheme uh, of the conversation, negligible. It's easy to get into the tens of thousands of dollars when we're talking about watches. And whether we're actually considering buying them or not, um, it's fun to. It's fun for everyone to, to admire the uh, achievements of so many of these brands. But I think it's extremely important uh, to bring ourselves back to um, this price bracket, sub 5,000, to keep these watch manufacturers um, in check. 
Thank you again so much to London Jewelers for allowing me to go through their boutique like a kid in a candy store and put together these six watches. If you guys have any questions about these particular watches or about any of the London Jewelers brands, go ahead and shoot them an email at watchinfo at londonjewelers.com. I've said this before, I'll say it again. They are absolutely lovely people to work with. Their access to inventory is incredible. Um, I don't hesitate for a second to encourage you to head on over. That's it. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you all soon. No matter how good you do at it, it's a twelve thousand dollar Frankenstein of design, like, and you're and you're putting lipstick on it, like, right. stop. Would you consider the Apple Watch being part of your collection? You say 